Let's get to know the Content-Aware Fill panel. The first thing you should do is open up the panel. Go under the Window menu and choose Content-Aware Fill. It'll likely open up here in the right-hand column. Personally, I like a little more space for it. So what I'll do is choose to undock the panel. You can then drag it over and place it next to the window here. It should easily fit. This gives you a little more room to see the controls as you're working. Now, take a look at the window from top to bottom. From the panel menu, you'll see a few additional options. We'll explore these in greater depth a little bit later. Below is the fill target. This is where you can pre-visualize the area that's going to be filled. The alpha expansion creates a little bit of overlap. This allows it to select additional pixels. The fill method offers three choices, object, surface, and edge blend. The object method is most useful for removing an object, which is what we're going to do here, the walking people. Surface is great when you are dealing with an area that has a lot of flat surfaces and needs to be blurred or blended. The edge blend method is great when you've got a very simple color and you just want to smooth things over. Below this is the ability to set the range. Do you want to do this for the entire composition or just for the smaller work area? Lastly, we have the ability to generate content, either a reference frame in Photoshop, which we'll explore later in the course, for creating a more accurate fill, or the ability just to generate the fill layer. All right, in this case, you'll notice what we're dealing with is an aerial drone shot and a walking couple plus a shadow. We're gonna remove them from the shot to keep things a little bit simpler. Let's go ahead and begin. Let's continue to work here and remove the object. In this case, you'll notice that we've got an aerial shot, and I wanna remove the couple. There's a lot of ways to do this, but we're gonna keep it pretty simple to start. Let's make an initial selection. I'll do this with the pen tool. I'm gonna choose the area around the couple, and as I click and drag, you see it starts to make a shape. The challenge here, though, is that this is making a shape layer, not a mask. So delete that, and make sure that the layer itself is selected. Now, what you can do is start to click. And if I click and hold as I drag, I get Bezier handles. Make the selection a little bit loose. You'll also notice a cast shadow, so I want to choose that as well. It doesn't have to be perfect, but once it's pretty well selected, come back to the beginning and click to close the loop. You'll see initially, it chooses the area with the couple. With the layer selected, press MM for mask properties, and temporarily set this to none. Now, if we drag through, you'll notice that the mask doesn't follow the action, so we need to adjust this. What I'll do is select the mask path keyframe and click the stopwatch to enable it. I can jump forward about two seconds at a time. Let's press Command-T or Control-T for free transform and nudge this into place a little bit. I can also scale as needed. And then press the return key. I'll go forward about two more seconds Press Command or Control T again, and just nudge this into place. I'm trying to keep a lot of that shadow selected, but not get too far into the other key objects there, like these large rocks on the beach. And I'm just continuing through the timeline, adding a few keyframes as I go. The Command or Control T makes it really simple, because not only can you nudge it into place with your arrow keys, but you can also adjust the scale at the same time. If you need to change a point, just shift click to select it and you can drag the individual points in as well. Because the stopwatch is enabled, every time I move this, it's going to adjust. Let's click off and back on the mask so all the points are selected and then Command or Control T. And just continue to nudge it into place. There we go. Scale as needed. You don't need to get too close to the subject, but a little extra room around is a good idea. Remember, shift click and edit the points if necessary. There's the 10 second mark. Click off the mask and click again to select it. That's only because I was editing individual points. And we can nudge that into place. Let's drag all the way to the end, make sure it's still good. 
and we'll nudge that down too. Great. Now we can drag through and check the mask. As I go through, I see it's doing a good job of following the action. If necessary, I can always nudge it into place a little bit. If there was a bump or a big movement, for example here, I could just nudge it in a little bit to refine that. But that's looking pretty darn good. Now what we're going to do is select the mask and set it to subtract. This creates a hole. I also suggest you put a little bit of feather on it, which softens the edge. This creates a nice smooth transition and makes the blending a little bit more believable. Now I'll play it and what I'm looking for is are there any areas where the people pop up or start to bleed through? Looks pretty good. I see a little bit of their shadow there, but I'm not too worried about that. That could be anything else. And I think it looks okay. Now that we've got a good selection, let's evaluate the fill controls. The alpha expansion is useful because as you notice, we can expand or contract the target area. I'm going to expand it just a little bit, about a radius of 10. It'll look a little bit beyond these existing edges for better blending. Now we need to choose a method. Because we're removing the object, the object method is going to be the right choice here. This will take the very dominant object out and look at nearby frames to try to determine additional pixels. It will then sample pixels forward or backwards in time and then move them to fill in the area. That's going to be the right choice. Now, if I want to do a small test, I could adjust the work area here like so. This will limit it to about one second. And that's good if you don't have confidence as to which method is going to work best. But in my case, I'm just going to set this to the entire area. Remember, you can use the shortcut key B for the beginning of the work area and the letter N for the end of the work area. All right, that looks really good. We're now ready to move on to the next stage. Now that we have a selection made and an area of transparency, we're ready to move on. Now, if you don't see this grid here, it might be because you don't have the transparency grid clicked. It doesn't really matter. You can view it as black or view it as the transparent pixels, whatever helps you better visualize. When you're ready, look at your settings. I suggest a slight expansion for better blending. And for this scene, the object method should work best. I can click Generate Fill Layer. What it's going to do is first analyze the clip. Depending upon the runtime of the clip, as well as the size of the frame and the speed of your computer, this can take anywhere from several minutes to just a few seconds. What it's doing is very similar to the warp stabilizer. It's looking at the footage, getting familiar with it, and starting to process it. Let's let this finish out. Once the analysis is complete, it's going to render new frames. This may take a few seconds as well. If you start to drag through early, you'll see flickers as frames are available in some places, but not others. Go ahead and leave the playhead at the beginning and let the rendering complete. Once it's done, you can press the spacebar to do a RAM preview. I suggest you preview at full quality. It should go relatively quick. It's looking pretty good. It did a great job of sampling those pixels from before and after and filling them in. I think that did a very solid job there. And I love how smooth it looks. Once the frames are cached, you'll see it play in real time. Even though the scene is very complex with sand and water and waves and froth, it really handled it quite well. All right, let's go on and explore some more options when using Content-Aware Fill. In our previous example, we used a mask to make a basic selection, and that worked quite well but we had to do a lot of manual work to adjust the mask. In this scene, I really like the shot, but clearly the crew thought it was necessary to cover up the logo on the laptop, which is pretty common. We don't want to show brands that we don't have permission for. However, the approach they took was a piece of gaffer's tape, and while it's gray, 
it's nowhere close to the same gray, and it looks like a giant Band-Aid on the outside of the laptop. Well, why don't we fix that? What we need to do is start by making a selection. With the layer selected, I'll grab the Marquee tool here for Square, and just click to make a basic selection around that. I can press Command-T, if necessary, to rotate that a little bit into place. Now, let's switch this to None temporarily. This is just so we can see the mask a little bit better. Now, choose the tracker from the window menu. If the mask is selected, you'll see the ability to choose to track. I'm going to track position, scale, and rotation. So, I can click the forward button and it will analyze. It's going to attempt to keep that object inside the box and use the same general approach as the laptop moves. So even though the laptop is on an unstable surface as the woman adjusts and shifts and the camera itself is moving a little bit, you're going to notice that that tracking works really well. Now, it got a little close there, but we should still be okay. Remember, it doesn't have to be perfect. It just needs to be generally accurate. With the mask here, we'll set this to subtract. And I can use the expansion to move that out just a little bit. Let's watch that through. What I'm making sure of is that the tape or the logo doesn't pop out on any side. So far, so good. All right, we're now ready to fill that in. In this case, it's not really an object. We've got this great gradation here. So I've got a couple of choices, such as surface or edge blend. I'm going to try edge blend because we've got a great gradient, and I suspect it's going to work pretty well. With everything selected, I'll click Generate Fill Layer. This is going to analyze it and come up with new pixels. It's also a very fast method. You see the analysis doesn't have to work so hard because it's just looking for the colors and it's going to do a smooth gradient. Now it's rendering out the frames. What I like about Edge Blend is it's super fast and when you have things like paper or metallic surfaces, it's really good at smoothing it over. Let's press play. That looks great. I love how smooth it is and the logo or the taped over logo in this case is completely hidden. I'll zoom back out so we see the whole shot. Let's just set this to fit and watch it from the top. Looks really good. Even though the camera is moving and the laptop is moving, it's able to smoothly blend and remove the logo and it looks great. Another selection method that frequently works well is the roto brush. It can analyze a clip and find edges over an area that you paint. To use it, double click to load the layer into a footage window. You'll see now composition versus layer. Now choose the roto brush. The key here is to not get too close to the edge. Rather, just draw and trace through the center of the object. You can get close to the edge, but you don't want to get too close. It'll analyze and attempt to find it. Click to add as necessary. You might want to zoom in a little bit. Holding down the space bar makes it easy to move. If I want to subtract, I just hold down the Alt key or the Option key and it subtracts. Again, you don't need perfection here, but a few strokes will build this up. This is a particularly tricky object because of the glass. But this is a good selection. Now you might be thinking, I could just do that with the pen tool. But where it gets particularly tricky is because the footage is moving. Now look down here at the roto brush. What you want to do is extend this and it's a little hard to see, but it's this tiled area. This is the search zone so that we can define that it's going to use roto brush on the whole clip. Now, I'll zoom out just a little bit and click forward about one second at a time. You'll notice that it analyzes the clip and attempts to adjust the roto brush. Still looks good, but if necessary, I can click to add a stroke. I prefer to move about a second at a time and let it build out the preview. Again, we're just paying attention to see how this is doing. Looking pretty good. If necessary, click to add and it will update. 
This one second jump method tends to work best for me. Some people will be a little bit more aggressive, but I like to keep an eye on it. It's looking pretty good. Remember, we're going to go ahead and expand this a little bit so it doesn't have to be a perfect selection. What I'm seeing is that even though the camera is shaking and moving and handheld, it's able to track that wine glass pretty effectively. So far, so good. And let's just finish this out. Looks great. Now at the bottom here, you'll see a few different viewing methods. You can click to view it as a mask, in this case, a ruby lith mask, view it as an edge selection, or view it as an alpha channel. What I like to do after I've got it working pretty well here is choose to smooth this a little bit. I tend to do this by reducing the chatter and that cuts down on some of the bubbling or rough edges and apply a bit of a feather. That's done nicely. Don't overdo it or you'll start to see a glow and that's not going to blend as well. So keep that number reasonable. So far, so good. You can also play with the contrast there if you're seeing a little need to tighten it up. Now, what I'll do is go back to the composition. And I see that it's selected the glass. What I'm going to do is check the box here so it inverts it. Now it's selected in the other direction. Using the Shift Edge command, you can go ahead and expand or contract. In this case, because we clicked invert, shifting the edge to the left or a negative number is going to expand it effectively by pulling it out here into the bigger open area. That looks great. If necessary, feel free to tweak the feather until you have a good overall selection. Now, looking up here at the alpha expansion, you could tweak as necessary since I've already expanded that a bit, I'll set this a little lower to a value of four. The texture is pretty complex. And since we're removing an object, I'll choose the object method. Everything else looks good, so I'll just click generate fill layer. Because this has a lot of texture in it, it'll take a little while longer to analyze the shot. So give it a minute or so, and then it will create the new fill. Once it's done, press the space bar to load a RAM preview. In this case, it's amazingly good. That texture up there is very clean. I love how it's organic and it recognized some of the surrounding pixels and really created a great wood texture. Even though the shot is moving, there's no issue and it's able to blend very seamlessly. All right, let's go on to one more method. Let's explore another selection method. To do this, double click on the layer to open it. Now, Choose the Eraser tool. The Eraser tool lets you brush in and edit. Paint over the area that you don't want. You can use the Brushes panel to adjust the size. What you want to pay attention to as you drag through is that the object doesn't appear so that the strokes are big enough. If you want to add multiple strokes, you can look at the Paint effect here to see them. I always suggest going to the very first frame before painting. There we go. Then you can drag through and see if there's any areas like there where it's sneaking. So I'll make that a little bigger. Looks good. And I feel like we've really gotten it. So now I can go up here to the Content Aware Fill panel. Let's bump up the expansion just a little bit more for better blending. And we'll go with the object method to remove these two signs. When I click Generate Fill Layer, it's going to analyze the footage. Now, there are several factors that affect this, but it's going to really come down to how big of an area are you erasing and what's the frame rate, as well as the size of the footage. This is still HD footage, so it goes a bit quicker than 4K video. Let's sit back for a moment and let that finish. Once the analysis is complete, it creates new pixels. Now, we can press the space bar to preview this. Make sure you're in the composition window to view it. In this case, we removed some pretty big objects, but it did create a good blend. If you don't like that, you can always undo. 
Just select the Fill layer and press Delete. Instead of the Object method, I'm going to try the Surface method and click Generate. It needs to reanalyze the footage, but will come up with new pixels. It takes a little bit of time, so let it finish. And you see the pixels are blended for removal. Now my suggestion here is to go a little bit larger when you're doing this. In this case, I'd have gotten better results if I blended down here a little bit more. So you can always tweak that. Feel free to keep practicing with the erase method. I do find it works, but I generally prefer Roto Brush or the trackable masks as they tend to do a better job in a lot of cases where there's movement in the scene. The image sequences that are generated take up quite a bit of space. If you right click on one of these, you can choose to reveal it. Just choose Reveal in Finder or Explorer. On their own, each file is not that big, 16 megabytes for the PNG. However, when you remember how many frames there are in a second, you see that we've got a bunch of folders with 3 gigs and 2 gigs worth of stuff. This really adds up, and this is for only 6 to 10 seconds of HD footage. So, you might decide to free up some disk space. If you have clips that are no longer needed and you press delete, they're still on your hard drive. What you need to do is clean those up further. So, from the Content Aware Fill panel, you can click on the submenu and choose to delete unused fill footage. This is going to search your hard drive and it'll detect anything that you're not currently using. When you're ready, click Delete Files. Now it's gone through and freed up that disk space. Remember, you can find that under the panel submenu to delete the unused fill footage. This fill footage can really add up and start to take up a lot of hard drive space. So if it's not being used, be sure to delete it if it is a variation that didn't quite work out. This will give you more capacity on your hard drive. Let's take a look at a shot that's mostly stationary. This becomes very easy to fill in. What we need to first do is make the selection. I'll start with the layer selected and grab my pen tool. Now, using the existing lines here, I can make a bigger selection. There we go. And if necessary, move those points in. I'm trying to follow the existing shape to get a really good clean target. Now, what we can do is twirl this down and look at the mask. I'm going to set it to subtract. It's looking pretty good, but just move this one point here slightly. If necessary, shift click to select an individual point and pay attention as you drag. I'm just trying to get it to match the general shape of the surface there by using the existing lines to help. A slight feather will create a better blend. There we go. Looks good. Now that we've got our initial selection, we're ready to move on to Content Aware Fill. Now that we've got our initial selection, we're ready to move on to Content Aware Fill. Up here under the Fill target, play with the Alpha Expansion. I recommend keeping this at a reasonable value, somewhere around 5. Then we'll try out the Fill method. Now, I'm going to make a smaller selection here and press the N key to mark the end of the work area. This way, I could test out the different methods. Let's start here, and we'll generate this with the Edge Blend method, which is very fast, and I'll generate the fill layer. However, let's stop and set that to just the work area. Analyzes, and creates the new frame. Well, that worked pretty well, but it's relatively flat and you see that it doesn't quite have the general area that we want to pick up on this texture of the concrete. So I don't think that works. I'll delete that, and then from the pop-up menu, choose to delete the unused fill footage to free up some space. Now, let's try this again. We'll still stick with the work area, but go with the surface option and generate the fill layer. It's going to analyze just the work area, which is much faster, and then create the new frames. That's looking pretty good, but what I notice are some extra random lines here 
that seem a little bit off. Let's reset that and switch once more to Object and generate the fill layer. It's going to look at the object and try to come up with new ones. Now, in this case, it's not bad, but I do see these extra lines in here that I'm not crazy about. So we need to really refine this here. Let's go ahead and delete this and refine things just a little bit more to get some better results. I'll select the mask path and we're going to tighten it up. So using the expansion, we'll pull that in a bit. Let's also tighten the alpha expansion and regenerate now. That's looking better because of the blend. Now you see that the texture is a bit smoother. I like that. That's working well for me. All right, let's go ahead and finish this up. Now that this is looking pretty good, I'm going to select the fill layer and press delete. We're now ready to tackle the overall object. From the Content Aware Fill panel here, let's delete the unused option and choose Delete Files. Additionally, I'm going to click and go to Content Aware Fill Settings. This brings up additional controls. Here, we can control what's created. You can choose to create the files at different bit depths. In this case, I'll set it to match the project. If you were working with different types of resolution, you could change the bits per channel, which will reduce the file size. You also can decide where it goes. Do you want to set an absolute path where these fills are stored, perhaps a fast SSD drive, or do you want it to go next to the project file? You can also decide what to create. Generally speaking, we'll use a Photoshop file for the reference frame, which is a technology we're going to look at in just a moment. But you can also choose to create Photoshop image sequences instead of the PNG sequences. And if you want to automatically clean up those unused files, just check this box so you don't have to keep choosing to delete the unused files. Let's click OK. Looking things over, I'm feeling pretty good about stuff. I'm going to choose to generate this for the entire duration. To make things more accurate, I'm going to choose to create a reference frame. This will create a new Photoshop file. This file is used to guide the Content-Aware fill. I'm going to come over here and I see the transparent area. Using the Clone Stamp tool, S for Stamp, I can select and start to line this up. But you see it's not exact because of the perspective. So let's undo here for a moment. And instead of using the regular clone stamp, we're going to come in and use a filter called Vanishing Point. This allows me to define the area a bit. I'm going to click here and define the planes. Not the airplanes, the surface planes. There we go, like so. Now, these surfaces can be expanded. Keep it in the same relative spot to start. Then grab the edge and pull if you need to extend. There we go. Now, we can use the Clone Stamp tool within the tool. Now, when I clone, it's going to recognize perspective shifts. And we can use this to create the reference frame. It does a better job of lining up the angles. And you see it can handle the trickiness. There we go. Nice. Let's choose this line here. And we'll extend that a bit. And that's looking a lot better. Now I can click OK. That reference frame is ready to use. So I'll close and save it. Let's switch back to After Effects. The reference frame was loaded in. Now what I'm going to do is move that back to the beginning here. Let's go to the very beginning and I'll press the left bracket key to nudge it. Because it's a lockdown shot, it's still lined up quite nicely. Using the object method, I'll click Generate Fill Layer for the entire duration. It'll analyze the footage, but this goes relatively quickly because the shot's not moving. Therefore, it doesn't have to think so hard. 
and that reference frame is going to help calculate the new fill layer. There we go. The analysis should be just about complete. And let's generate those frames. We can press the space bar. And you see it did a great job. Let's go ahead and extend that for the entire duration. And watch the whole shot. Now that reference frame that we created was totally used to accurately create new texture. I was able to precisely match the lines that were here to get a much more believable clone. The key is to take advantage of a couple of technologies. First, that reference frame, then the great vanishing point technology for perspective-based cloning inside of Photoshop. In this case, we have a very big movement in the camera path. Not only is the subject moving, but the camera's moving, and it's moving at a diagonal. This makes things a bit trickier. My suggestion is go to a good frame when the object is pretty clear. Now, I'm going to add a marker here by dragging this over with the shift key held down. It just gives me a good reference point to come back to. Now what I can do is zoom in, hold down the space bar to get the hand tool, and create a fairly accurate path. I'll click the pen tool and choose Roto Bezier. And you see that it automatically starts to create curves. There we go. I'm keeping it relatively tight to the subject. And closing the loop. Let's switch this from add to none. As we drag through, obviously it doesn't stay in the right place. But this is easy to address. Going to that mark, I'll zoom out a little bit and select the mask. Now that we have our starting point and our starting point, let's start to track. My suggestion is highlight the mask and go to the tracker. There are several different methods here, but I believe we need to do position and scale and rotation. Skew may also be necessary. I'll start to track backwards from the current point. It's doing pretty well but I notice it's starting to elongate the top. So let's pull that in, keep it a little tighter. My suggestion then is twirl this down and remove a few of those keyframes in between. This way, you'll see it's good and then it evolves. Let's keep tracking to the left. Select the mask path and keep going. Now, if it starts to get too long, just click on an individual point. Shift clicking will usually do it. Nudge it in. And select some of the keyframes. And delete. Again, as we go through, we get a pretty good idea of what's happening. But let's keep tracking. Select the mask. And let it continue. Now it's looking good, except it's getting a little bit rough there. Just the top is getting too elongated. So shift click to select the points and I can nudge these around. This particular scene is tough because of all of the lateral movements side to side. That's working better, but we'll need to select some of these frames and delete them and select mask and continue tracking. Looks good. Let's come back to that first point, zoom out a little bit, and track forward. Looks good, and as the bike goes off the frame, tracks it nicely till it gets to the very end there, when it completely disappears. So we can delete these frames, and go forward, select the mask, and just nudge it into place. Let's drag through. Looks good and follows the object off. All right, we've got a pretty good selection there that looks quite accurate. Let's move on to the content aware fill. Now that we have our initial selection, we're just about ready to go forward. My suggestion is switch this to subtract 
and then apply a little bit of a feather. This will help with the blend. If needed, you can turn off the alpha channel by clicking on the transparency grid and just get a good idea if you have the object, which it looks like we do. Now, in the Content Aware Field dialog, give the alpha a slight expansion to calculate and capture more detail. Don't overdo it, but a small amount between 5 and 10 usually works well. Tell it to track for the object here since we're removing a bike rider on the open road, and then track the entire duration. When ready, click Generate Fill Layer. It's going to analyze the clip, looking at the movement, the color, the tone, and then attempt to generate a new image sequence to fill in the missing pixels. Now that it's done, we can press the space bar and watch the effect. It's looking really good. By going a bit tighter here on the object, we avoided hitting any of the edges of the road. That was necessary to really focus here. The only area you might want to track is the shadow of the bicycle. You can notice it here on the road a bit, right there. Let's select the object here and click to add another mask. It's a little tricky. If you lose it, click on the first point, zoom in a little bit, and keep going. Now it's a very faint shadow. Come back in, close the loop. There we go. Subtract and feather. There we go. Let's add a keyframe for mask path. Track backwards. There's our second mask. And let's just generate that new fill layer. Let's go ahead and have a look. And it looks great. The shadow has been taken care of on the ground. We've taken a look before at the reference frame feature, but it's really going to come in handy here. In this shot, we've got a very complex scene with multiple types of textures, strong lines, and other material. I also see some points where the shot is moving, and we have intersection there on the subject with the smartphone. Now there's a pretty egregious part here towards the end where it really overlaps, but I'm going to try right about in here. Let's also zoom this back a little bit to 50% to start, so we can see better the edges. Now in this shot, we've got a lot of movement, a very complex background, and overlapping subjects. Looks like a pretty good frame there. We're going to use this as a reference frame to generate new pixels. To do this, I'll park the playhead where needed and grab the pen tool. What I'm looking for is to select the area that we don't want. Now you notice it's making a shape layer. It's really important that when you're doing this, you have the footage layer selected. Otherwise, you'll get unexpected results. There we go. I'll make a basic selection around this phone and come around here and choose the subject. I'm going a little bit looser because there's a lot of movement in this footage. Let's set that to none and we'll check how the mask is doing. Not bad. There's a bit of movement there. So I need to expand that. There we go. Let's see if the frame stays clean. So far so good. Getting a little close there on the hair. Dragging through. So far so good. There's the phone. Now over here at the very end, with a lot of overlap, those frames may not be salvageable. It's getting pretty complex, but this looks to be a good place to generate our reference frame, right about there. So with the playhead positioned and the footage layer selected, I'll just go to the Content Aware Fill panel and click the Create Reference Frame button. But before I do so, let's set this mask back to Subtract, so it removes the material. And now we can generate the reference frame. In doing so, it sends the file to Photoshop. So let's switch there and work for a little while. In Photoshop, we need to replace these missing pixels. I'm going to do this by starting with the Content Aware Fill. 
Command or Control click on the layer's thumbnail to load the selected pixels. Then choose Select Inverse to reverse the selection. I'll now use the Select Modify with the Expand command to create a bit more overlap. 20 pixels should do. Now we're ready for Content Aware Fill. I'll choose Edit Content Aware Fill to bring up the dialog. Here, it's showing me the pixels that are being used. I can decide to remove something, for example, painting out her face. So those pixels are not considered as part of the active area. And you'll see as you make this change how the pixels are subtracted. When you release, it will analyze and recalculate. That's looking pretty good. The sample area is definitely useful. If you want to adjust the opacity of that selection or the color to better see it, you could just paint over things. Remember, feel free to use the Add or Subtract to control which pixels are selected or chosen. Next, take a look at the sampling area. This has been set by the brush, but if needed, we can go ahead and choose another method. Now, we're dealing with the fill settings. These get a little tricky. I'm going to start by choosing Scale here, and that's going to give it permission to adjust these. You see how they scaled a little bit to better match the scene. Let's uncheck that. That's really a subjective choice, but I think that it's working a bit better to deal with the perspective and the angle. Next is color adaptation. Changing this will blend the texture, not just the color, but analyzes it, and I think that high is doing a better value there. I see a little bit better matching as the color extends. Then take a look at the rotation amount. This is how much it's allowed to change. A low value is creating small forks. A full rotation gets really aggressive, and you see there's lots of variation as it goes. I'm going to actually set this to none because of the very strong line pattern, and I don't want rotation variation. Additionally, the mirror option can reflect the pixels from one side to another. However, if you notice, what's happening there is that the lines start to bend backwards, matching these lines. Each subject is going to vary on what's going to be the right amount for the fill settings. So it's important that you look at these options and tweak them until you get a good visual match. In this case, it's feeling about right. Still see a little bit of things that I'm going to need to touch up, but it's looking a lot better. I can now output that to the current layer or a new layer. This gives me some flexibility as to where the pixels go. I'm going to go with the current layer for now and just click OK. And it generates it to the Photoshop file. All right, let's keep working here to clean this up. Now, we're going to go ahead and refine this a bit with some cloning. Let's press Command D to deselect. And I'll choose Filter, Vanishing Point. This is perspective-based cloning. Now what we need to do is choose our edges. So I'll click to define a starting point and just run it right down that scene. Follow the key edges here and attempt to align this using the current planes. This point here looks a little off, so I'm using the other lines as guidance. That looks a lot better. Looking at where those blue lines go, I'm paying attention to see if they seem aligned with the existing grid. Now we can extend this. Just grab the edges and pull up or down. This will take the grid and make it cover more of the scene. There we go. And I can really see where these are getting off a bit. So we're going to take care of that. Now I'll grab the Clone Stamp tool within the tool. This allows you to select and choose new pixels. So I'm going to select right here by Option or Alt clicking on that line and come down and line it up. You can use the left or right bracket key to adjust the size of your brush. And what I'm going for is something that's going to match the width there of the gap. And we extend that. Continue to work and just Option or Alt click to set your source point. Line it up and extend it out. What we're trying to do is get the correct line width there. Now, it's going to be a little bit of trial and error, and it's never going to be perfect, but we're creating general pixels that are going to be sampled to help with this alignment. My suggestion, we'll just start up here at the top, is I'll Option or Alt click and start to extend that line so the bench goes more in the right direction. You may see some patterns here like these nail holes. We're going to deal with those in just a moment but use this to create the pattern that's believable and see if you have to occasionally release so that it resamples the line. 
Remember, this releasing step is important, so it can generate the new pixels. If you don't release, it continues to sample the old pixels, so you may have to let go of the mouse button periodically so that it can regenerate those sample points. That's looking really good. I'll come down here, Option or Alt click, line it up, and continue to go. Remember, if necessary, backtrack and fill that in, and you see the bench is looking really good. This takes a little bit of time, but with patience, you can get a great texture. And remember, think of the alternative. Doing this frame by frame in the video would be a horrendous amount of work. So even though we're spending five to 10 minutes cleaning this up, it's for the good of getting a great content aware fill. Let's continue to finish this out, but you get the general idea. I'll just do a few more clones here and then we'll skip to the finished frame. Feel free to practice on your own and try to get the best overall clone. Don't worry if you have little blemishes along the way like those nail holes or other small challenges. We're gonna take those out with the healing tool in just a bit. All right, that's looking really good. Let's click the OK button to update the frames. We're just left with a few unwanted pieces of texture and that's a simple cleanup. Let's go to Photoshop here and I'll press Command-0 to maximize the frame. Now, let's choose the Spot Healing Brush. The Spot Healing Brush will automatically select new areas. I'm gonna set this to Sample All Frames and make a new empty layer. Now, I could heal to its own layer. I'm just gonna click on these unwanted spots and it's analyzing the surrounding areas and removing them. But that removal is on its own layer in case it makes a mistake and I don't initially see it. That gives me the flexibility to go back and quickly refine if needed. You can look at some of those existing areas and still switch over to the clone stamp. S for stamp. And you see the aligned tool there. Now I wanna finesse the seam a little bit. I'll option or alt click. And I don't need to worry about vanishing point because we've already done that. So I can just use that to clean up the edge slightly if it's a little rough like there. And by passing over it, we can continue to refine that a bit as needed. J to switch back to the spot healing brush and just click on those unwanted blemishes or nail holes. And they're quickly healed. Here, the pattern was getting a little repetitive because I had a small area to sample. So I'm just removing that extra knot in the wood and it takes it out. It's looking so much better. This texture is really amazingly accurate. And I like where that's going. Now here it feels a little strange. So I'll go back to that clone stamp tool and just option or alt click, line it up and tighten that a little. By the flexibility here of working, you can keep coming back and revisiting your clones as necessary. We're gonna use a little visual trickery later with a vignette to darken this edge down because we really wanna pull the attention over to our subject anyways. But taking this three pass approach on cloning and content aware fill is really quite amazing. The jacket looks good, the bench looks good. I've removed any of those unwanted blemishes with the spot healing brush and I'm very satisfied. I see a little bobble up here. So let's just go with the clone stamp tool, option or alt click, come over to that point and line it up and just blend. Look over your seams, looking for areas where the seam seems rough, and you can paint and blend as needed. Remember, everything is on its own layer, so it's very easy to toggle the results, and look, I could continue to tweak this for days, but in general, I think it's looking great. So at this point, I'm gonna close and save my frame, and it hands it back. We switch to After Effects, and you see that the frame is layered in. It's frame 126, and there's our reference frame that was generated. All right, let's move back to Content Aware Fill in After Effects. Now that we're in After Effects, we're gonna use this Content Aware Fill. You see the reference frame is down here to help. Now what's necessary is we're gonna choose Fill. We'll go with the Object method with a slight expansion and tell it to do the entire duration. Now. I need to click Generate Fill Layer. It's going to analyze. Hopefully these pixels will be enough to cover the entire range. If not though, 
we can adjust and create a new mask and do a secondary fill. It's now analyzing the shot and depending upon the speed of your machine, this can take a few minutes. Be patient while it looks at the existing footage. This is a pretty complex scene, so it's going to need to use a lot of analysis to calculate the new pixels. Now that the analysis is complete, it's generating the new frames. Again, the scene is a bit longer, so it will take a little bit of time. While this is happening, I'm going to add one more thing under the layer menu. I'll choose to add a new null object. This is an invisible object that can be used to parent other objects. We'll go ahead and place that above and use the parent pick whip. I'll connect that to the other layers. This will come in handy if we need to move things. Now, let's let that fill complete. The initial blend here is looking relatively good, but it's not perfect. I see some extra challenges. So I'm going to choose undo for a moment and let's remove that fill. Let's back off here and modify the mask. I'm going to give it a heavier feather so there's a bit more of a transition. And let's expand that mask slightly. Now we can regenerate the fill layer. You'll notice this is doing a nice job. However, on some of these areas where the frame is bobbling, we don't have all the pixels we need. There's a lot of challenges with this particular shot. This is why, while the Content Aware Fill is doing a great job, we're going to take advantage of the Null object to scale things up a little bit and just help obscure some of the edges. So now if we drag through, you'll see how it's handling large portions of this very well. And a few parts are a little challenged. Let's go ahead and make our tweaks. I'm going to go to where it really holds up and mark the work area. Press N to mark the end and then go to the beginning and press B. Now using that null object with everything parented to it, it'll be easy to make a few tweaks. I'll press S for scale and Shift A for anchor point. And this just helps me scale up the shot. And I'll nudge it over a little bit, like so. There we go. And we're just getting past some of the more egregious pixels and focusing the shot. Now let's have a look. You see we've got the shot moving. It's pretty solid. I could probably back this off just a little and nudge that back down for a little more headroom. That's good. The texture is holding up nicely. Now to really draw your eye into the subject, I'm just going to reframe things a bit. Let's do two things. Layer new and I'm going to choose a solid layer here. We'll make this white and place it on the top. I'll use the gradient ramp. Let's set this to have a ramp. We're just going to create a ramp from the side. This becomes our transition zone. Now we can adjust the blend here. Let's use multiply. Now we've got a great ramp going onto our subject. You see we can refine that and that's really helping. I'm now going to add another adjustment layer and on this let's add the Lumetri color effect and all I'm going to worry about is the vignette here. Creating a slightly dark edge with a bit of a feather. All right, let's have a look. That use of ramping really helps sell the scene. It pulls your eye into the subject and into the brighter zones. And what I see is believable. Now you can go back and tweak and mask and do a little bit more cloning. Remember, there is cloning here in After Effects. But in general, we've been able to remove a tremendous amount of detail. Feel free to continue to play and refine. But as you see, challenging shots sometimes take a few passes and a couple of refinements. But in this case, we were able to get a tremendous amount of repair done in a relatively short time. Now, let's let this finish out and we'll play it in real time. You'll see that even some of those imperfections you see on the paused frames are not nearly as noticeable when the shot is in motion. So overall, some great results.